Hey everybody, it's the Jack School Podcast. I am good It's good to see you, Harrison. Good to see you too. Um, so I got a I got a fun one for you today. Um, usually, this question uh, it, it sort of gets asked in whispers around us. Uh, my my son actually had the the audacity to to ask it right to my face, and I love him so much for it. I'm I'm deeply proud of him because uh, he comes to me and, and he says, "Dad." What if I'm bored in church, um, Pastor? What would what would uh, Jesus say about being bored in church? That's that's great, huh? Well, you know, as pastors, we should probably confess that he's not the only one, right? I um, too have been bored in church. You know, I don't think I've ever shared this with the St. Paul's folks here at St. Paul's, but I'll, I'll I'll come clean right now. Uh, it was a combination of being bored and tired here. This would have been. Been a couple of years ago, and 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 here at St. Paul's we have an opening hymn, or opening hymn that we have a hymn that occurs right before the sermon, and I can remember putting my head down and reading. You know, oftentimes I just read the sermon. I save my voice for the preaching, and so it was like five or six verses long. And I'm looking down at it, and I just kind of close my eyes and I'm listening to the lyrics, and the next thing you know, I open my eyes and it's verse six. I was out. <laughs> I was out verses two through five. I was gone. And so, so I was like, oh my goodness. I'm like, can you imagine, can you imagine mm-hmm. all of a sudden uh, the, the end of the hymn and where's pastor and he's snoring behind the lectern. I mean, that would have been glorious. Oh my goodness. That's, well, um, so that that's a different color too. Cause like, I know that I, I am a, 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 I talk a little bit fast. I'm a little bit animated and I've still watched people sleep through my sermons. And you look at it and you're like, have I failed you? How is this my fault? And then you just realize, man, it's everybody's a, everybody's a sinner here. Um, the organist, I'm sure, would probably struggle in the same way. But what do we do with this, this sort of idea that we're bored here? Well, okay. So first of all, I think we should maybe handle it from the perspective of you know understanding, okay, if there's boredom in the church, our reaction to it, and our response to it. Often, oftentimes in the church, what happens is that we try to offset the boredom by spicing things up. And I'm going to use a term from a good friend, uh, Reverend <laughs> Sean Dancer. He, Sean Dancer would always say, hey, are we going to make the church more sexy this week? And so, <laughs> and I, I think I asked you before, and I said, can I say the word sexy? And you're like, yeah, let's, let's just go be a little edgy here, let's right? Let's put it out there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but but no, in all seriousness, so what, what do we do? We try to put some lipstick on the church. We try to, what, spice it up a little bit, make it a little bit more sexy to offset the boredom. But then that puts the, can we say this with the onus or the responsibility or the burden on the church itself as if it's the church that is the problem. But mm-hmm. really, when it comes back to it, the issue with boredom is tied back to our old Adam, definitely our old Adam. So yeah, I, I was thinking about this because there's there's a positive and a negative way to, to look at this. And, and certainly, um, there are, there's this part of me that I recognize. I can, I can read a book um, that, that's not particularly compelling, but I'll just get lost in it. I'll read for hours. Um, I can watch a TV show that I've watched a hundred times before and pretty well can quote to you as we go through the rerun of The Office. Um, but reading a chapter of scripture, I, I just, it, I slog through it, listening to a 10 minute sermon instead of a 20 minute TV. There, there is something in my old Adam that, that does genuinely sort of want to rebel against hearing the things of God. Um, but there's also a positive side of it too. Um, and I think both sides of sort of trying to, to, um, to spice up the church, uh, get, get to, to be used as a weapon against even this. Um, nobody's ever actually bored when they're in danger. When you feel safe, that's when you can actually fall asleep. When, when when you feel comforted, that's when you can sort of let your guard down. What if what if the the whole point of this is that maybe this isn't a, finally a place to set aside enough worry to just let your mind sort of fall apart? Maybe maybe the issue you're right that the boredom part is us, but that church itself is producing it. Maybe it's it's good thing to have a safe place and not just one more thing to to be extra excited about for good or for bad. Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you went there because in our baptismal liturgy we talk about the the church being the holy ark you know this ark uh which mm-hmm. i love the imagery and i here at saint paul's we have this huge huge uh you know huge uh ceiling that's kind of like looks like the, like the bottom of a boat and so i just love the imagery too as well of of thinking this through from the perspective of that we're in this holy ark of the church and everything else around us is a raging sea so we can actually be safe in the lord's house and be there and so uh when you see a child falling asleep on a mom's arm or a little one who is just absolutely beaten and is resting. 
there is a sense it cuts both ways. You can say, mm-hmm. God be praised that they feel relaxed enough that they are sleeping secure and not worrying because they're in God's holy church. And so there's an aspect to that as well that I think absolutely spot on that, that uh, you know, you wouldn't necessarily fall asleep maybe um, on a dangerous subway system or something like that, or you maybe wouldn't fall asleep uh, in the general public. But the very fact that you have the ability to do that in the church shows that there's some, some actual comfort there. You, you pointed out, though, the baptismal liturgy, and I can't help but remember the time Jesus fell asleep in the boat while all the disciples were panicking because he was just, he was, things were okay. Things were not as bad as everybody was making them out to be. So you can talk about it in, in terms of, you know, do you actually need more excitement and more, more sort of uh, shock value in the church? Well, no, you probably actually want one place where you can finally be safe when the rest of the world is a, stor- is a storm around you. Um, and and we, can, we can talk about sort of the negative side, too, uh, of sort of why is it that, that some things are just so much more compelling to us than, um, well, just simply meditating on the words and promises of, of God. Um, and, and there you can kind of see that that part of the danger uh, of measuring that is, is that, well, whenever God is sort of marked by your emotion, that's that's called enthusiasm, and it's real bad because it, it, it leaves you in a place where whenever you need Jesus the most, he always feels the farthest away. Um, because if Jesus is sort of marked by, you know, the, the, the sensation of just feeling alive in, in that particular moment, what about when you're when you're dying in the hospital room and you just can't for the life of you feel it? Or, or worse, watching somebody else because then you're so helpless to actually feel at peace with it. Um, wh- what do we do then? Well, I think I think it comes back to this understanding of when it comes to the liturgy and when it comes to the the, the readings, there should be a sense of familiar, familiarity. So mm-hmm. That word comes across correctly off my tongue, but 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 an understanding of it that that we're we're used to it, that we hear it, and there should should give us actually comfort uh, in of itself. And so, you know, back to this you know idea of being in the hospital and so forth. I can recall. A gentleman once, uh, once upon a time, one of my shut-ins, uh, he had severe Alzheimer's, and he would tell the same story about him getting bucked off of a horse every single month when I would visit him. And you know, he was actually in the same room as his wife, and he didn't even know who his wife was across the way. But when it came time for the Lord's Supper, we'd start talking about the Lord's Supper, and he'd fire up on the third article of the Apostles' Creed. And then when it came time for the um, uh, liturgy for communion, he would say it all with me. He would say the Lord's mm-hmm. Prayer. He would actually, uh, his mouth would just confess the words of institution because it was ingrained in him. It was driven into him, and he found great comfort. And everything else was gone in his life except what? that which remained, that comfort of the gospel, the comfort of those services for years and years and years being driven into him, uh, into his mind and becoming a part of him. And so there's a sense if if the church is, let's just go back to that idea of the church, if it is sexy and changing every single moment, it's always hyped up. There's no consistency. There's no, uh, you know, it's not familiar to the person. And uh, frankly, I, I think we can end up in a lot of danger in that route. Right. Um, and, and even more so, um, not only was it familiar, but it worked. Um, I, I think that's that's really, really a profound thing, that, that something can be super exciting and, and, and all-encompassing. Um, if you want to fill up the church pews on Sunday morning, like honestly, just don't talk about Jesus. Show a Marvel movie instead. Um, people will come. Don't charge money. Um, it's easy to... to make something compelling there's actually they're they're formulaic um just sort of how how similar all the marvel movies are that that still make billions of dollars it, it's a pretty easy thing to to recreate at this point in time but uh does it does it actually work to save you so that on the last day your your body will rise on the last day that this this man who who had lost so much um even even that the most precious gift uh, of his of his wife is seemingly on the other side of the veil he was tied to her in a way that that alzheimer's can't ruin and in a way that that'll bring him to the resurrection did it did it work might be actually the better question than was it entertaining because then then you can talk about what the job of the church actually is and like i don't go to the dentist to be entertained like if, if the dentist was like not sexy enough for me um I, i'd never get a different dentist um like if man you just you 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 did not do nearly enough cool stuff while you while you fixed my teeth yeah, um, I'm getting, in that, yeah yeah <laughs> right spin it around some um no i want you to do a good job and and here actually like i don't really want to um go to the dentist i'm going to be honest with you but i want to go to one who's going to do a good job at, at what his his vocation is to to do so what's the job of the church is it is it to be entertaining because if it is it should look like something and if it's to forgive your sins then it should it should it should look like something 
you know, just the other day, uh, one of our parishioners at St. Paul's, we were talking and, and visiting with a new person in the church, and he said something to the effect, he said, the thing I like about St. Paul's, which is going to be, you know, like many, many of our churches, he said, you know, when I come here, I just want to have a couple hours on Sunday morning where everything of my busy life, everything from media, everything from music, everything that's going on out there, I just, I don't want it here. I just want to be here in this place and this time to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he has, what, defeated death, uh, conquered uh, sin itself, uh, satisfied the wrath of God, and how he's done that all for me. I just need just a couple hours every week to not worry about all this and just to hear about my Lord and Savior and what he's done for me. And it's beautiful, right? It's absolutely beautiful. And so that kind of goes back to that idea, too, of having that comfort in the sanctuary to be able to come in there, to be so comfortable that this place is all about Christ and his gifts for me. And it's not taking from me, but it's giving to me. This this time mm-hmm. on Sunday is not a time where I'm going to be uh, you know, asked to cough up a bunch of resources and energy and, and attention, but I get to sit there and receive uh, boy, that's a contrast from the rest of the world. I mean, I, I think about this way. N- name one place in our society where you gather so that you receive gifts, free of charge, free gifts, uh, that you're, you're called to gather together to receive free Because I'm, I'm going to a football game tonight, but I'm, I'm going to cough out pro- probably about 70 bucks on concessions tonight, you know? And then, you know, really, it's going to be 70 bucks yeah. on concessions. Yeah. And I'm going to have to cough some of that up. And then afterwards, you know, we'll have to help maybe clean up a little bit and, and go from there. But name one spot where I go and it's all about me receiving and nothing's expected of me. In fact, what I bring to it, the table is going to be my sin. And I'm given what? Righteousness. That's profound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's actually, it's such a, a, a shocking thing that the world actually struggles with the idea of it. And, and so we start to, um, I, I think we actually start to create a self-fulfilling prophecy with it where, you know, you expect that the church can't be free. And so we start to market by all of the the social ministries of it that, that do cost. Um, and, and those are good. They're not wrong, but they're not the thing that actually makes the church the church. Um, it's the forgiveness of sins, one in Christ, that means something so much that it's good to have a soup kitchen. It's good to support a, a local food bank. It's good to do all those things. But yeah, just come sit and listen. If you never, ever, ever are able to give to the uh, to the offering plate, the forgiveness is still free for you. It, it, it's yours. And, and it's not uh, ticketed. It's not charged. It's just there. And if it, if it becomes so familiar that you space out once in a while, um, you know what? I'm going to go so far as to say, first and foremost, your sins are forgiven. And second, God be praised. God be praised that this is a safe place to be bored. Yeah. I, I, I can't add to it, but you're 100% right. I mean, yeah, God be praised that that this is so comforting and so rich that mm. uh, I can just sit there in that pew and say, I'm okay. Christ has me. I'm in yeah. his church. I'm among the baptized. I'm in the ark. As all, if we can say it this way, as all hell is breaking loose in that wild, wild, wild uh, waters of the world, I'm here in this ark and Christ has me. Amen. Pastor, thanks so much. Yeah. Good to see you, Harrison. Hey, you too. Take care, my friend.